Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. And this is Masters, Seen and Unseen by Donald W. Six, FRC. An article taken from Rosicrucian Digest, volume 18, number 10, November 1940. Masters, Seen and Unseen by Donald W. Six, FRC. I wonder how many of you are looking for a master. If so, what kind of an individual is he? What do you think of when you hear the word master? Do you want to hear of sages of long ago, magists and patriarchs, men of Egypt and Atlantis, master teachers? Yes, we have heard of many of them, but perhaps we can find a more satisfactory teacher than those of tradition and history. Not that we do not appreciate their worth and wisdom, but words neither mine nor theirs can ever help us if we are not ready. Perhaps, though, to be absolutely logical, we should investigate the dictionary definition of this word master, our dictionary being the nearest common concept, or rather average concept, of the English-speaking people gives us a common point at which to start our discussion. The dictionary states, master, a noun, one who rules or commands others, director, etc. Also an expert, verb, transitive form, to subdue or overcome, intransitive form, to excel. Also under mastery is given dominion, preeminence, eminent skill. Besides this, there is master as an official title, such as master of a lodge, master craftsman, etc. Now, do you see how necessary it is to define that which you wish to know? And someday it will be just as necessary to define and carry through on a plan as to how you wish to live to achieve desired ends. Masters are many, according to the definitions above, and perhaps you are already a master. Strange thought, but true. Have you a business the details of which you understand thoroughly? and the problems of which you alone can untangle. Then you have mastered and are a master of your business. You command it. You force that business to pay dividends and a living to you. Are you a housewife? Perhaps you have become a master by mastering the problems of housekeeping, having worked out a program wherein all the elements of that profession are under your control. These are but two of the many forms of mastership. Strangely enough, having achieved mastery over any one thing, the individual immediately realizes the possibility of a greater degree of knowledge and thus travels the path upward. Expanding consciousness gives us realization of higher and still higher possibilities and potentialities, and our own degree of knowledge is dwarfed by the greater view. Hence, as an abstraction we can say, mastership is an ideal in consciousness, ever evolving and never static. There is a stumbling block, however, in believing we are masters of anything, this is that our own ego often allows us to believe we have mastered when we know only the letter of the requirement and not the application. If we believe we have mastered law, for instance, we have only to try a number of cases in court to find whether our self-estimates are true. Again, we have heard of masters of the East through wandering teachers who present a phase, and often an unimportant one, of self-mastery. These say, look you and become as I am. Is it important that you spend a lifetime holding an arm overhead to prove your control of that segment of your consciousness? Yet many hundreds of men seeking holy honors in the Far East do this. Of course, there is an angle to these stunts accomplished by fakirs, and that is living by arms is a living. A modern psychologist might even suggest that these antics are really adolescent exhibitionism. Don't scoff, though, because in the tricks of the Fakirs and beggars of India is shown a control and understanding of bodily processes far beyond the understanding of modern science, although these same Fakirs with their knowledge cannot fight and master a plague, as have our Western scientists. The involuntary actions of the body, which to the Western mind are not controllable, are mastered early in the work of the Eastern adepts, men who work in the Far East for neither arms nor glory but for self-improvement, aspiring to the higher states of consciousness. The laws of breathing, of concentration and meditation are well known to minds properly trained. But the physiological makeup of certain groups lends itself more readily to one type of teaching than another. Regardless then of the teaching or the faith to achieve even the right to follow the path, we must obey the biblical aphorism, know thyself. You might ask, what have all these scattered thoughts to do with my own search for my own desired mastership or master? Only this, from the East comes a simple rule which is contained in one word, single-pointedness, the ability to know what we want and to concentrate on that one thing. 
Whether mastership for you means being a master aluminum salesman or one of the anointed who have mastered all life's problems, that is all which we can realize. The answer is the same. Separate that which you would do that is at hand, do it, then tackle the next step, etc. Until hand over hand, one job at a time, you reach the state of mind where the sense of futility is lost. The early stages of struggle are always the same for all because they break old habit patterns which strive to maintain their hold. Would you have gold? Master the laws of gold and make your sacrifice on the altar of your desire. Yes, you can have gold, position and honor among men. But you cannot have every other attainment known to man at the same time. Let us set aside our separate objectives and for the moment hold the same ideal of a master. Let us hold the thought of this one to be a man like ourselves in everyday life, beset by problems but rising above them, faced with others about that need help and helping them, drawing on the infinite supply of all human minds, the cosmic for his strength, not Alka this or Alka that, but depending on control of the life forces to sustain him. This man can do any of the stunts of the lovers of the hidden magic, but does them not because there is no power in empty bragging. This man loves all but spoils none, is firm but gentle, is aided by higher intelligence when need arises. He can destroy by a word, but would die before using that word to save himself. Every human advancement is aided by this man quietly, and oftentimes he is not even identified outwardly with the movement. In his presence, all men are equal and he is superior to none, but all recognize his superiority. Who is this man? It is you or I, if we desire it. How to attain it? We might make a few suggestions. After all, aren't we all on the broad highway of life and each one of us garners a little which may be of help to others? Then we must know that the first requisite of mastery over the mind is physical health. The brain is influenced by toxic poisons generated by sluggish livers, bile accumulation, kidney disorders, etc. In fact, any of the vital organs out of tune will cause impaired mental activity in its objective function. By mind's objective function, we mean that part of the mind which is in contact with the world of actuality, or as some would say, with the world of material things. This world is made known to us by the five objective faculties, hearing, seeing, feeling, smelling and tasting. After a little deliberation, you will realize that all we know of the physical side of life is through these five senses and is translated by the brain. The evidence of these senses is at the very best not too reliable as to the real nature of people, objects or things. Hence, we must make them serve to the very limit of possibility. How can you or I expect to develop a special or psychic sense if our own physical instrument is not even receiving the more gross vibrations correctly, if at all. In other words, if the ear of man can detect a certain range of sound and you can hear but a half of this range, how can you expect to develop a yet finer sense? Many people with optical defects have found a new world about them. New colors, new shades and new interpretations of creation on first putting on eyeglasses. This experience is not new, but is highly indicative of how accustomed we become to the instrument of special sense we are using and to its deficiencies instead of training it through objective and subjective mind to give us the very best interpretation possible. The subjective mind does try to compensate for our abuses, and yet it can respond only to the willed suggestion of the objective mind if the desire of the individual is other than constructive. The translation of impressions by the mind through the organism of brain is grotesquely twisted when the brain has a physical handicap or is, as we stated, impaired by poison or distracted from its normal duty by trying to compensate for physical abuse elsewhere in the system. Shall we then, in our desire to become as our ideal or master, put down first? To make the body temple as perfect in a physical way as possible. In other words, if poor eyesight can be corrected, see that it is taken care of. If sinus tubes are constantly annoying you, see your physician if unable to take care of it yourself. Investigate the food which you eat. Surely the fuel you use to stoke the furnace is worth some attention. Learn to add the breath of life to your body. Breathe deeply and fully. No abnormal exercises are necessary, but air has a very vital part to play in helping your physical self and also the brain. Use it for a stimulant, a tonic, a rejuvenator. When tired, inhale, hold the breath, mentally accept it as the powerful agent it is, and release it. Repeat until fatigue leaves. 
Water is another necessary element in your structure. Have you forgotten this point? About 70% of your bodily weight is liquid. See that this supply is furnished without pulling the needed element from the bloodstream. These three requirements, food, water and air, are a trilogy that will help you far toward your goal. To achieve the powers of the master we seek to emulate requires real physical health. This health is obtained through common sense rules taught in any physiology course. True, there are mystic principles contained in the air, in the water, and in the food. The why we can worry about a little later after we have developed a strong body feeding a healthy brain. Now that we have accomplished the mastery over the body and can depend on it to serve us, let us investigate the next phase of our being. With a healthy body trained to serve our needs, let us learn more about the mind that should govern it. Functioning through the physical brain and brain centers, we find the body has a dual control. First, the objective mind controlling the voluntary actions of the body. In this vehicle are all commands and will directions centered. When the objective decides to do or have done, it wills that it should be so. The command is passed on to the subjective mind, which at once tries to put the law of the objective mind in effect. This is a feature of the subjective mind. It does no original thinking other than deductively reasoning from the point of command forward. All involuntary actions of the body are controlled by the subjective half of the mind. The beat of the heart, the contraction of the lungs, peristalsis of the intestines are all under its rule. All sense impressions are stored here and not received for future use. Like a great file is this memory, but each impression is catalogued by the objective or waking mind and then referred back to the subjective for filing. Now here is the reason why so many theories of teaching based on information imparted direct to the subjective mind fail. Because although factual information is received and filed by the subjective mind, the power to recall this is centered in the objective and therefore it cannot be used. Mastery of these two phases of mind calls for competent instruction and a great deal of patience. Perhaps in your attempt to know yourself, you will forget to look for a master outside yourself. You will learn from your study that you were created dual and that in attuning the dual phases of your being, you will be able to progress along the path. As long as the spiritual you is separated from the physical you, this long will you fail to obtain peace. Did we forget to mention the spinal nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system, each working in its own way and for the good of the body? These must be understood and controlled by the neophyte before a high degree of mastership is attained. Why? They involve your receptive apparatus, both psychic and physical. Do you want a simple proof that sensation is carried through a psychic medium or the sympathetic system? Take as an example a man who has lost a leg. He still feels pain and sensation in a non-existent part. This would be impossible were actual nerve fiber necessary to carry impressions. In the secrets of your system are carried potent forces but little dreamed of. Dynamic forces which have tremendous import to the man who has mastered his primary lessons. In attunement you will find a power foreign to anything but itself which is infallible as God himself. A spark which indwells in each of us that must be fanned to a flame in our consciousness of which love and unity are integral parts. You say, but will there be no guides to help us along the path? Yes, of course. Never a desire for help is held in consciousness, but what the masters know it. But they know that only by suggestion and love can they assist. Only experience, faith and experiment with empirical learning will give you the God consciousness which makes the perfect man or master on this plane. Who are these who would inspire the worthy? Brothers who have traveled the self-same path, who have conquered all temporal and physical lust and are relieved by virtue of knowledge from the physical plane for the time. Some of these, such as the venerable K.H., have inspired many but we must not associate these masters with any condition or physical setup, even if they are living in a physical way today. Necessarily, when the time sense is superseded by a higher consciousness, as it always is in the psychic, the signposts we are used to objectively are gone. Hence, to the timeless ones, we must attribute the virtue of their being without giving it form. Just as we recognize a rose by its odor without seeing it, so we will know the highest inspiration by a psychic sensation not necessarily by a form, voice, or objective realization. 
To the fully developed mystic, it makes but little difference as to whether the individual is expressing through a physical body or not. The part of each of you that is a part of the cosmic oversoul is also expressed in the mystic, the difference being in controlling and using the forces. Hence, before there is a response from your inner being toward the higher intelligence, you must have refined your consciousness to that place where you already understand that although aided from without, all actual growth must come from your conscious realization of the real you. The real you, that which has been described as soul, ego, or any other term which carries the true meaning to you, should be your master. This real you is a part of the cosmic and is never separated from it, but can be and often is prevented from expressing its true nature. The things which prevent this are, among others, selfishness, dishonesty of purpose, lust, physical abuse. When these things are mastered and true, love comes into flower in your consciousness, then will you be able to receive the cues to further search from those about you who have progressed beyond you. They may even be among your own associates. Strangely enough, once the mind has started in dwelling, very little outside aid is required for considerable time. The mystery of your being will offer one problem after another, and when the time comes when you can say, I know myself, then indeed will you have reached attunement with the cosmic. Since you know the microcosm, the secrets of the macrocosm are open to you as by a key. All nature will be to you an open book, Men's hearts will be as your heart and time and space will need a new dimension. Then we must surely realize there will be yet more to master, still on and on, always greater vistas ahead until all the bounties of divinity and purpose have been explored. Then let us know that to contact a master, seen or unseen, be a master of that which you see, that which needs mastering here and now. Do not just read about one who has mastered but learn his language. Progressively develop until your voice can be heard by the master and pieces within your heart and soul. The next step will take care of itself. Let us start now with you and me. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can please consider donating to Wars of the Roses, links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.